What is up amigos? Today we are going to be discussing the mass flow rate. So we're going to be discussing what is it, how to calculate it and common uses. So first of all, what is it? Let's say we have a face here and we have the flow going through at a velocity of u infinity. And let's say it's just a regular rectangular face. The mass flow rate determines how much flow is going through this face in any given time. So we usually do it per second. And if we have the flow going through, we know that there is air going through. So all we really need to know is the velocity of it. So how do we calculate it? So the mass flow rate, which is denoted by m dot equals rho u infinity times the area. And this is the area of this face here. So if we have the density, which is rho here, this is the density of whatever fluid you're using. So I'm gonna say air. So that's approximately 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed, but it may not be, it may be a little bit different. If the velocity is one meter per second and the area is one square meter, the mass flow rate is one kilogram per meter square, or per meter square, one kilogram per second, sorry. So that means that every second we have 1.2 kilograms of air going through this phase. So why is this important? Well, it can tell us how much air we have going through a system. So for example, common uses, one would be if we have, let's say, a turbojet. Let's just say we have a regular object and it's a turbojet, for example. What a turbojet does is it sucks air in. This is very simplified. It sucks air in and you put fuel into the line. You mix it all up and then downstream of there, you then burn it. So you then create a lot of, or you release a lot of energy into the turbine. And then you have a very fast exhaust coming out of the back. To know how much fuel to put into the line, you need to know the mass flow rate. If you put too much fuel in, the mixture will not burn. If you put too little fuel in, the mixture will not burn. You need to have the right amount of fuel. And if you deviate that from that a little bit, you will not only increase the inefficiency of the turbojet, but also to the point where it may not even burn and may not function. So knowing what the mass flow rate is, is very important here by knowing what the velocity is coming in, the area of whatever point you need, and the density of the air or the, the fluid, you can then determine how much fuel you should be dumping in for the stoichiometric ratio you need. Another very important use for this is in a converging diverging nozzle. So, or anything that approximates a converging diverging nozzle. And I'll explain in a second what this is. So converging diverging nozzle is one of the quintessential aerodynamic situations where we have the flow coming in and we have the velocity mu1 and we have this area here, a1. It then, the contraction starts to occur. So the cross-sectional area starts to reduce and we go to a2 here. Then we increase the area again, the cross-sectional area back to a3. Now, if you looked at our previous video of Bernoulli's equation, you will have seen this before and you will know where I'm kind of going with this. So we have u1 coming in and as the cross-sectional area reduces, how can we tell what the velocity is at this point? What is u2? And what's equally important, if the area increases, how can we tell what u3 is? Well, that's where the mass flow rate equation can come into play. We know that the mass flow rate through this entire situation, through this entire uh, nozzle here has to stay the same because if you have flow coming in, the flow doesn't get directed anywhere. It just has to keep going straight through. It doesn't go into a black hole and get sucked somewhere else. It has to go through this cross-sectional area, this cross-sectional area, this cross-sectional area, and any other point along this converging diverging nozzle. So we know that the mass flow rate at any point should be constant. So if we assume that the density is constant and if the Mach number is equal sorry, equal or less than 0 0.3, then that is a good assumption as far as aerodynamics goes in um, the research field. The reason why we choose this number, well, first of all, it's sort of from history, but if the Mach number increases above 0 0.3, the error in the density is now going to be 2% or greater. So that means that if we have a Mach number less than 0 0.3, we can assume that the density of air everywhere is the exact same as what we measure it anywhere. So if we measure the density of air out here or in here or wherever, and we measure it to be 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed here, we can assume that it's going to be the same at each one of these points. And that's because the velocity is not fast enough to compress the air. If the Mach number increases above this, 
then we start to get a significant error in the density, 2% or greater. And when we get to like Mac 1, for example, it just skyrockets, the errors become great. So we need to factor that in when we go to sonic flows and transonic flows. So let's come back to this converging diverging nozzle. We assume that density is constant. So we know that row one equals row two, which equals row three. And this equals 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed. The, dense, the velocity we assume to be one meter per second, or it can be whatever you want. I'm just gonna use one meter here just for argument's sake. So we know U1 equals one meter per second. U2, we don't know. U3, we don't know. But the areas we do know. So let's say we have A1, this equals one meter squared. A2 equals 0.5 meters squared. And A3 equals two meters squared. So plugging all this in, we know that M1 has to M.1 equals M.2, which equals M.3, because the mass flow rate must stay constant across the system, unless you're extracting the mass somehow, which in this case we are not, or in a turbojet we are not. In a turbofan, which is a little bit different, where we have bypasses, that's a different story. But in these simple cases, we have the exact same mass flow rate the entire system. So we can calculate mass flow rate at station one, because we know the density of area is 1.2, we know the cross-sectional area is one, meter per se one square meter, and the velocity is one meter per second. So that means we have 1.2 kilograms per meter, uh, per second, sorry. And that equals m.2 and m.3. So to figure out what the velocity at stations two and stations three are, it's quite simple. We already know the density, we already know the area at these points, and we know the mass flow rates. We just rearrange the equations to find what u2 and u3 are. So u2, equals the mass flow rate at station two, divided by the density at station two times the area of station two. So that equals 1.2 divided by 1.2 times 0 0.5. So if you do the calculation, you'll figure out that that's two meters per second. If you want to find out U3, it's again M.3, the mass flow rate at station three, divided by the density at station three times by the area, the cross section area at station three. So this is 1.2 divided by 1.2 times two. So if you do the math, it will come out to be 0 0.5 meters per second. So that's how powerful the mass flow rate is. It's a very simple equation, yet it's so applicable to so many situations and it gives us a lot of information very quickly. And these are based on very fundamental properties, which we often know at least a few of them. So it's quite easy to figure out. So let's go quickly through again what the mass flow rate is, how to calculate it and common uses just to recap. So what it is, is how much of a fluid, not just air and not just water, any fluid in general, is going through a cross-sectional area every at every given point in time. So we use it per second, kilograms per second is the SI unit, but you can use whatever units you want as long as you remain consistent. How to calculate it? Well, the mass flow rate equals the density times the velocity times the area, the cross-sectional area. And common uses, for example, figuring out how much fuel you need to dump into a turbojet to get the flow to uh, ignite properly and burn well. Or if you have a converging diverging nozzle, you can then figure out what the velocity is at each one of these stations. And the converging diverging nozzle is really just indicative of any geometry which has some sort of convergence and or divergence. So it doesn't need to be a converging diverging, diverging nozzle. You could have just have a converging nozzle so it just gets smaller in cross-sectional area if you want, or it could just be diverging. It could be anything really. It could be like a wiggly one and you can figure out still <laughs> the mass flow rates at each one of these points, the velocities, the areas, whatever. So that's the mass flow rate. That's the end of this video. Make sure to like, subscribe. And if you want to learn more about this and or any other theoretical concept in aerodynamics, I recommend the textbook Fundamentals of Aerodynamics by John Anderson. It's a textbook I used back when I was learning in university, but it was an earlier edition. In the link in the description, you can find the up-to-date version and also courses that we do for theory. And I'll see you in the next video. Peace out, amigos.